I'd like to introduce our speaker for today, Dr. Yash Varadhan Pant. He's an assistant professor in the Department of Electrical and Computer Engineering at the University of Waterloo, where he leads the Control Learning and Logic Group. He received his PhD in Electrical Engineering from the University of Pennsylvania in 2019 and is a postdoctoral fellow at the University of California at Berkeley from 2019 to 2021 before joining Waterloo um, a few years ago in 2021. His research focuses on design making for multi-agent autonomous systems, drawing on elements of control theory, machine learning, formal methods, and optimization with application in ground robots, human robot interaction, and swarms of aerial robots. The title of his talk today is Formal Behavioral Specification Languages and Methods for Motion Planning and Control of Autonomous Systems. And now I'll hand it over to Yash uh, to Give the talk. Thank you, Colin. Thank you for the kind introduction. Uh, yeah, the talk title is a bit of a mouthful, but we'll mostly be talking about robust decision making for motion planning of autonomous systems. And our mathematical tool of choice is going to be to look at it through the lens of formal behavioral specification languages. Um, I'll apologize in advance. The slide, uh, the slide deck does have a few equations, but hopefully they're mostly there just to help you um, get the point about what we're trying to do. As Colin said, I run the Control Logic and Learning Group at the University of Water at Waterloo's Electrical and Computer Engineering Department. Um, hopefully why we have this name should be clear by the end of this talk. And today's talk is going to focus squarely on the multi-robot and autonomous systems side of things. So as a quick outline, I'll first talk about what are formal um, behavioral specification languages and how they can be used to write down specifications or behavioral requirements for autonomous systems. We focus on one particular uh, formal language called signal temporal logic, and then I'll introduce what our motion planning problem for autonomous systems looks like. After the problem is introduced, I'll talk about three different um, robust multi-agent motion planning methods, a centralized one or decentralized one, and one where your system's dynamics are not known perfectly. After that, we'll move away from our model-based or more um, I guess first principles view of the world to a model free um, paradigm where we'll try to learn policies to satisfy a different class of formal specification languages called linear temporal logic objectives. And after that, I'll hopefully uh, have some time to talk about some open challenges that relate to cybersecurity and privacy in these um, particular settings. Uh, the talk itself is not much on cybersecurity and privacy, but hopefully the problems themselves that we we'll talk about. Um, they are open to um, elements of cybersecurity and privacy being key players in what those problems are. As a motivating problem for today, let's focus on urban air mobil mobility or this uh, futuristic or well, near futuristic scenario now where we'll have multiple manned and unmanned autonomous vehicles carrying goods and people throughout dense cities or um, rural areas. Why is this problem relevant? Well, in 2018, NASA started what was called the, uh, I think it was then called the Urban Air Mobility Grand Challenge, it's called something else now. And in order to look at, essentially, is there a market for something like this? They commissioned a report from Booz Allen Hamilton and one from McKinsey and Company. And the takeaway from that was that by 2030, they expect uh, urban air mobility to be a multi-billion dollar thing. Now, their key takeaways was that there's a lot of consumer demand for goods getting to them quickly. This, of course, is pre-pandemic, right? So I don't know how the forecasts are going to hold up now. Um, and given the way the technology is evolving and the way people are actually using these, mostly these unmanned aerial robots, it seems like the timing is right that this will indeed turn out to be quite a, <clears throat> quite a uh, profitable market in the near future. So keeping this type of an urban air mobility setting in mind, Let's move on to see what type of behavioral requirements do we need for these systems and how can these formal specification languages help us out? So as a motivating example from the robotics um, side of things, let's consider this case where we have four aerial robots. Um, think of them as in teams of two each. Red and blue are one team, uh, green and black are another. And they have this mission where pairwise these teams have to be inside these goal sets every six seconds. So these goal sets are regions uh, marked in green in the top right of the figure. So within six seconds, both these teams should be in opposing green sets. Then they should go to the other green set and repeat this process twice. They should do so while avoiding this no-fly zone or unsafe region in the middle. They should, of course, not crash into each other or the other objects around them or fly out of this 
uh, what is a motion capture environment. So for something like this, the type of methods I'll talk about can generate trajectories within a fraction of a second. What you'll see over here in the video now is on the top right is a simulation, and on the main screen is the um, actual experimental evaluation of our, one of our methods. So you see that within the first six seconds, all four robots make it inside the opposing green uh, virtual regions, then they go to the uh, to the other green region and they repeat the process twice. They're not flying inside the no-fly zone. They're not crashing into each other. Um, and also worth noting is that what you're seeing in the simulation is pretty much exactly what's happening in the real world as well. So that's part of the strong mathematical guarantees that our methods have associated with them. Anyway, so uh, the mission itself sounded pretty complicated. How do we formalize that mathematically in an unambiguous and succinct manner? And the answer is we're going to use what's called signal temporal logic. So I won't get into the uh, full grammar of signal temporal logic or where it came from. I'll try to explain it through examples. So we can think of that as a behavioral specification language. And each specification is a logical formula that evaluates to true or false and has elements or operators like first what's called an always operator, which says that some property should hold throughout an interval of time. Mostly used to encode safety. For example, if I have two quadrotors, Q1 and Q2, I don't want them to enter an unsafe set or crash into each other. I can use the always operator in STL to encode that. And the way I would write that down mathematically is that I would have phi1, which is a logical formula, equal to this square, which is the always operator. 0 to 10 is a time range of interest. So this says that always in an interval of 0 to 10 seconds or the next 10 seconds, I don't want, so that symbol over there is logical negation. And what I don't want is that the position of quadrotor one, Q1, should be inside the set given by unsafe. So these are all sets in 2D or 3D. This notion of a position or a signal being inside a particular set or over a particular threshold is what we call an atomic proposition or the smallest building block of such formal specification languages. I can also say something similarly for the second quadrotor by appending it with the logical AND operator. So this says always in 10 seconds, quadrotor one is not inside the unsafe set, and I don't want quadrotor two to be inside the unsafe set. And I can also say that I want the distance between the two quadrotors to be always greater than or equal to some predefined threshold delta. So that's safety using signal temporal logic. Missions uh, for autonomous systems, of course, go well beyond safety. So we also have an operator called the eventually operator which now says that an event should happen at least once in a given time interval. And what I want over here is these two chord rotors to make it inside a goal set. So I can say phi2, which is a logical formula, and the symbol over here is the eventually operator, which says that in 0 to 10 seconds, I want quad rotor 1 to be inside the goal set. It can get there anywhere um, in time in this given interval. And similarly, I want the second quad rotor to also make it inside. We can also have if then type of implications in signal temporal logic. So phi three is a formula that says eventually quadrotor one in goal implies that it's dropped package P one, which is a discrete event. And similarly, um, eventually in 10 seconds, quadrotor two inside the goal implies it's dropped package P two. Now STL allows us to take these different specifications and combine them in different ways. You can nest operators. You can there's also another operator called the until operator. We won't get into all of that. But let's say I combine all of these operators using the conjunction or the logical and. I end up with a specification psi that says always be safe and reach goal set. And if you're in the goal set, drop the package before time runs out. And in order to evaluate the specification, I need trajectories or sequences of signals uh, that correspond to positions and velocities of these squad rotors of duration at least 10 seconds so that I can check that the property held throughout this time interval of interest. We call this time 10 seconds as the specification horizon of a formula. And in general, in this talk, we'll only focus on specifications that have a bounded uh, specification horizon, even though STL goes even beyond that to infinite time requirements. All right, so with that, hopefully we have some idea about how we can use this formal behavioral specification language to write down requirements for autonomous systems. And then we can move on to the problem of the motion the motion planning problem itself. So a little bit more formally, an STL specification, you can think of that as a Boolean valued function that will take in state trajectories or real valued signals over time 
of all my UAVs or autonomous systems of interest and map it to a single Boolean true or a false value. True if all parts of the specification are satisfied, otherwise false. And then this problem of generating motions or these trajectories that satisfy these um, specifications can be thought of as what's called a finite horizon discrete time control problem. So if you're familiar with control theory, this is probably the most studied class of problems. And the way we do that uh, do this is we consider our specification horizon, for example, what was 10 seconds in our previous example, um, and we discretize that uniformly in time, let's say, and I have n plus one intervals of time. And my problem then is that I want to find a sequence of control signals or decisions for my autonomous systems such that the resulting trajectory satisfies the STL specification. So that symbol over there just says trajectory satisfies the spec. Of course, I want to take these decisions while being aware of the dynamics of my robots. That is, there are some first principle physics that they need to follow, and I should keep that into mind. I should also take into account constraints on these robots. For example, I shouldn't ask for thrust beyond the maximum thrust of these robots. I should try to keep their velocity within predefined bounds. Similarly for um, roll rate, pitch rate, and so on. So now that we know how to write down an STL specification, we kind of have an idea of what our motion planning problem looks like. It's essentially a problem of finding decisions to satisfy the STL specification. And of course, we're not the first people who have thought of this problem. It's being studied for at least two decades now. And what I'll do is I'll take a very coarse grained look at some of the related work. So I'll talk about two of the main classes of uh, existing methods. First is that you take this notion of trajectory satisfying the specification and turn the problem of finding decision variables into that of a solving a mixed integer optimization problem. Essentially, there's automatic encodings that allow you to go from an STL specification, like the one we've written down for the two quad rotors delivering a package, into a mixed integer um, linear set of constraints. If you satisfy those constraints, um, great, you've satisfied the spec. There are some problems. The first is that mixed integer programming itself does not scale very well as your um, as you add more agents or your specification gets more complicated, these methods break down very quickly. They also produce what are called zero robustness solutions, and we'll take a look at that through one of our own works uh, if we have time towards the end of the stock. The other class of methods try to simplify the problem, at least take away the continuous aspect of it. So rather than working with the first principle physics or the differential equations that describe the motion of the robot, you work with a discretized workspace, for example, a grid world over here, and you have it's pretty simple dynamics. And then essentially the problem becomes one of doing a graph search. Um, these methods, of course, are limited in what you can express. Um, and they also do not scale well, especially as you add more agents or if you have a three dimensional workspace, as you would expect to have with aerial robots. Um, these methods again break down. We'll also take an example, uh, take a look at a similar class of methods in a problem that we study later on. All right, so at the core of it, if I want to generate behaviors that satisfy these complex uh, behaviors given by STL specifications, um, the related work really says that I have to rely on combinatorial approaches, and these do not scale well. So this motivated what we did starting in 2017, um, which was to go from solving a combinatorial problem to one where all our decision variables are now continuous or real valued, which allows us to overcome combinatorial explosion while of course, paying a different price, which you'll see later on. Uh, the key ingredient that allows us to do that is this notion of robustness of an STL specification. So again, an STL specification was a binary valued function, took in your trajectory and said true or false. Associated with each STL specification, there's also a continuous valued function called the robustness function or the robust semantics of STL. It takes in the same input, that is your state trajectories over all robots, but now rather than saying true or false, it gives you an up, the function gives you an output which is mapped to the extended real line or gives you a single real valued output. And this mapping has the nice property that if it evaluates to positive it values, it means you have satisfied the specification, otherwise it's false. Or a little bit more intuitively, we can think of robustness as a degree of mission satisfaction. So the larger values it takes, the more disturbances you can tolerate upon deployment. For example, you have large wind gusts, if you have a large robustness, you can probably tolerate those. The closer you are to zero, small disturbances can make you go from satisfying a specification to violating it. And if you have 
and high negative values, you've done a very good job of violating your specification, which is not what we're looking for, but can actually be useful in another class of problems called falsification problems. All right, so before we dive into how do we use the robustness function, let's quickly build it for one example so that we have some intuition behind um, what we're doing over here. So we look at a safety specification and we talk about the robustness of that. The specification here says always in 10 seconds. I don't want the squad rotor one to be inside either the unsafe set one or inside the unsafe set two. So that's the logical R operator that's uh, in shaded light blue. And what we're going to do now is try to build up a robustness function for this. So again, the specification five is I'll give it this trajectory of positions, for example, shown by this black line, evaluated over the specification and get a single true or a false value. Now the robustness function associated with this specification is an algebraic um, function over here, um, which is I look at the minimum over time of the negative max of a sign distance metric that tells me how far away is my position to a particular state. So we have this metric test. Um, just think of it as it takes positive values if Q1 is inside unsafe one, negative values otherwise. And then I look at the negative max of whether Q1 is inside unsafe one or inside unsafe two. And the cool part is that we can build such a uh, function for any STL specification in an automatic manner. So there was work in 2009 that actually laid down the robust um, semantics for STL specifications. We're just relying on that over here. This robustness has the nice interpretation that let's say it takes on a value of R, which is let's say greater than zero. What that means is if I draw a tube of radius R around my trajectory, which had this robustness of value R, it means that all trajectories that lie inside this tube will also satisfy the specification, which kind of intuitively gives us this idea behind why we call this the robustness function. Now, again, I've built this only for the safety specification, but it also holds for all STL specifications. So whether they include eventually or other operators, you still have a robustness function defined. And for the remainder of the stock, let's just say it can be built automatically from a given STL specification. All right, so we have this robustness function that takes your trajectory and tells you if it's positive, it means your specification is satisfied, otherwise it's false. And we know large positive values are good. So intuitively, now all we want to do is generate behaviors that maximize this robustness function. Um, hopefully that makes sense. Again, robustness being positive means you have satisfied your desired behavior or you're satisfied your STL specification. However, there are some technical hurdles that need to be jumped through before we can actually get around to maximizing robustness. First is that the max and min operator that we saw in the previous slide, they're of course in disc the discrete max and min are not smooth. That is, they have kinks uh, shown in the figure over here. The sign distance metric that tells us how far uh, a state is from a set is also not smooth. And what that means is because they're not smooth, derivatives don't always exist. So gradient based algorithms do not work out of the box. If you're into optimization, um, robustness function is also usually non convex for any specification of interest, which makes the optimization problem of maximizing it even more challenging. In the first class of works that we did in this line, I won't get too much into it. In 2017, we actually um, came up with what's called a smooth uh, robustness of STL specifications that is continuously differentiable, which means I can take as many derivatives as I want of this robustness function, which is what optimization solvers like. So that was in this covered in this work called smooth operator. And now going forward, what we're going to do is just assume that we have this ability to build up a smooth robustness function for any given STL specification. And then we can try to solve the problem of robust multi-agent motion planning for systems that have STL or signal temporal logic specifications as objectives to satisfy. We first take a look at a centralized trajectory planning method. That is, there's multiple agents, but there's a single decision-making computer. Think of it as sitting in the middle, talking to everyone. Method is called uh, flyby logic, and again, it's been but it's been published at more venues than is written in the slide now. At its core, it's a continuous optimization for maximizing smooth robustness. And our decision variables over here are waypoints for these drones to fly through. So think of these waypoints P1, P2, and P3 as my decision variables. 
And what I want to do is maximize this notion of smooth robustness. And again, just like the robustness of an SDL specification had the property that if it's positive, it means the underlying specification is satisfied with smooth robustness. Uh, the smooth robustness has a property that if you evaluate it over your trajectory and it takes on a value greater than a particular threshold epsilon, it means the underlying specification is satisfied. So this epsilon is something we can pre-compute. Um, again, details we don't need to care about. And the type of guarantees that I want from my um, method over here are that first, I should satisfy these specifications in continuous or dense time. That is, even though I work with a discrete time representation of the system, nothing bad should happen between my samples in time. And second, I want to generate trajectories that can be flown by the robot, or I want kinematically feasible trajectories. That is, velocity, accelerations, jerks are all within some predefined bounds. So the next slide will get a little bit technical. We'll dive into what's happening inside flyby logic, but again, I'll keep it at a relatively high level. The idea is that, and again, I'll explain this through the context of only a single drone because it's easier to visualize. But if you have multiple um, agents or multiple drones in your problem, you just have copies of this of what's going on over here. So let's say I have one drone starting at a position P0. My decision variables are these waypoints P1, P2, and P3 over here. Let's say all, going all the way to Pn. And each of these waypoints are uniformly apart in time. That is, it takes me some time Pf seconds to fly from P0 to P1, P1 to P2, and so on. And you can think of Pf as being, let's say, of the order of seconds. So think of it as being one second. Now, if I have a mission that needs to be at least, let's say, h seconds in duration, the second point over here just says, it's a common sense check that says I should have enough waypoints so that my flight time is greater than uh, my mission um, horizon. Now, just having these waypoints in blue alone is not enough. I could have these waypoints being inside the goal, outside the unsafe set, but the behavior that gets my robot from P0 to P1 and P1 to P2 could be unsafe. So what we're going to do is we'll connect these waypoints to each other using what are called jerk minimizing splines for multi-rotor robots. And what that does is it gives me a unique way of going from P0 to P1, P1 to P2, and so on. Um, what we do is we'll, of course, generate a continuous time trajectory and then sample it at a much higher rate of time, dt. So think of if tf is one second, dt is 50 milliseconds or of that particular order or 100 milliseconds. And so what this exercise does for us is now that even though my way, my optimization variables are just these waypoints, p1, p2, p3, I have a representation of the entire trajectory at a high frequency in time um, given by closed form linear function. And so each of these high frequency samples shown by these red stars, essentially, even though our variables of interest are only these waypoints, we have a unique linear representation of what's happening between these waypoints. And so, let's see. Bye. Um, and so what that does for us is essentially gives us a nice representation of um, that if I move these waypoints around, I know how the trajectory is going to move as well. And so I have a representation of the entire trajectory using very few variables. And I have derivatives that tell me if I move my waypoints in one direction or the other, how is the entire trajectory going to move? This is something, again, that continuous optimization solver is like. And so with that, we can actually move on to the optimization itself, where our job is going to be to maximize smooth robustness over these trajectories for all robots of interest. My waypoints are going to, my variables are just going to be the waypoints, again, P0 to Pn for each of these um, drones that might be in the problem. And I want to do this subject to constraints such that my robots fly trajectories that are kinematically feasible in continuous time. That is, their velocities and accelerations are bounded for all time instants uh, from zero till the end of the horizon. Now, because of the denseness of time, of continuous time, this is an infinite number of constraints which of course gets problematic. One of the main results in our paper was that we don't actually have to worry about an infinite number of constraints. We can find these functions LB and UB for velocity and acceleration so that are nice and linear, and that allow us to constrain our motion from one waypoint to the next, such that our velocities and accelerations are always bounded. Or essentially, it's the intersection of all of these infinite number of constraints, and we can find a closed form representation of what these infinite constraints are and actually end up getting only 12 times the number of waypoints, number of constraints per drone. 
So it's again an efficient representation of constraints. And again, the constraints are only on my waypoints, which are my variables of interest. Now, as I mentioned before, this is a non convex optimization, and that is the hardest class of optimization problems to solve other than mixed integer problems. But the good news is we don't have to solve this problem to a global optima or even a local optima. We can solve this optimization if the objective reaches some predefined positive value epsilon tilde, which we can compute um, and it's going to be computed in a way that it ensures continuous time satisfaction of the underlying specification. That is, it's not only the trajectory given by these red stars and blue waypoints that satisfies the spec, but the entire continuous time connection of these points is going to satisfy the specification and be kinematically feasible as well. So with that construction, if we can find such a solution, it means we have our guarantees of satisfying our complex requirement in continuous time and also getting kinematic feasibility of our resulting trajectories. So all right, so it's all well and good. I've shown you a construction. There's an underlying optimization. Now let's see how this works in practice. So as a benchmark problem, we look at a simple or relatively simple reach avoid problem where the job for the robot is to reach a goal set within eight seconds by always avoiding an unsafe set. Um, there's capital D UAVs in here. They should also all always maintain a 0 0.2 meter separation between each other. This type of a requirement can be naturally encoded in signal temporal logic as shown in this formula below. And again, it just says always each drone should be inside, should be outside of the unsafe set. Eventually they should get inside the goal set and always they should keep a distance of 0 0.2 meters, at least 0 0.2 meters from each other. So shown over here is an experiment where um, these crazy fly robots, which are the size of my palm, which is why we only want them to be 0 0.2 meters away from each other, are going to fly out this uh, specification. So the goal set is on the far side of the room. The unsafe set is in the middle and there's eight robots. I think the resolution, I'm not sure what happened to it, but again, what you see over here is that all eight of the robots, they swarm inside the uns inside the goal set. Within eight seconds, they, in fact, they get inside the goal set and then they fly out. Um, they're not crashing into each other. They're not flying into the unsafe set either. And this behavior that you see where these robots get inside the goal set and then head out, letting the others enter, is something that is naturally generated by the optimization. We don't have to manually solve a scheduling problem to decide who gets to go when. Um, that's all naturally handled by the formulation that I'd shown you. Now, how quickly can we solve the optimization itself? Turns out, um, as you increase the number of UAVs, of course, the compute time that it takes to find satisfying solutions does slow down. But it looks like for this particular problem, it's slowing down linearly, as shown in this um, plot with the blue line, where the x-axis is number of drones, the y-axis is the amount of time it takes me in seconds to, or when I say me, I mean an optimization solver, um, to solve um, the, the problem. Shown in dashed red is what was then the state-of-the-art mixed integer-based optimization. Uh, so you can see it slows down pretty drastically, and as you increase the number of UAVs beyond four, that's what that particular solver broke down. These results are now half a decade old. In fact, we've gotten much faster, but, this trend, but the trend over here still holds. We, of course, like I said, we've gotten much faster. We have um, an open source implementation of all of this, including a GUI that you can use and an easy to use C++ API. Um, and we, have, we are in fact an order of magnitude faster. So if we are, for example, for the problem that I showed you with eight drones, we can solve this in a fraction of a second. All right, so that was a nice toy problem to show you that the method works. How do we apply this to more realistic problems where you have to have mission horizons that are of the order of minutes and not seconds and more complicated behaviors to execute? Um, so more complicated behaviors can be represented again in STL using nesting of operators. So we can nest or have one operator inside the other in STL. One example is the always eventually operator, which says that I should do a task phi repeatedly. So over here we have an example where the specification says, uh, again, in this problem I have one quadrotor, two goals. The specification over here says that always in 10 seconds, every two seconds, my quadrotor one should, visit, should be visiting goal one. And also in every 10 seconds, my quadrotor one should also be visiting the goal two. What this kind of enforces is, <clears throat> Again, desired behaviors that will involve repeatedly visiting goal one and goal two 
in a time interval of 0 to 12 seconds. Um, so for example, shown over here is one trajectory that if you can imagine time associated with it, it would satisfy this particular specification. We can also nest operators the other way. I can have always inside eventually, or call the eventually always over here. And what this says is that I should hold the behavior phi after doing it at least once in a given interval of A to B seconds. So the example over here says that eventually in five seconds, always for the next two seconds, the quarter order one should remain inside the goal set. Or what that means is that quarter order one gets inside goal one within, sorry, five seconds, not 10 seconds, and then it stays there for the next two seconds. So that would then satisfy this given STL specification. We can use this to specify behaviors for a more realistic urban air mobility problem. And we have this case study of simulated drone operations in the Philadelphia International Airport region. Um, the entire problem was solved in 3D, but I'll show you a top-down view because that's easier to understand. You have regions in red, which are no-fly zones. They're over runways, um, taxiways, and busy interchanges on the nearby highways. They have regions shown in green, which are regions of interest that my um, aerial robots might want to visit. And over here, I have five aerial robots doing three different types of missions. I have an autonomous air shuttle that's going to loop from a parking area or um, a Wally Park over here, go to the international terminal region, go to the next parking region, come back to the terminal, repeat the process, and do this while waiting at these terminals and regions long enough to let passengers on or off. So think about nesting the eventually and the always operator in STL. I have another autonomous air shuttle that's going to go from a parking that's further out to the international um, terminal, repeat the process. I have these autonomous um, drones that are just going to pick up goods from the DHL area and take them to the business complex, drop them off, come back, pick up more stuff, drop them at the business complex again. And then I have an autonomous air taxi that's going to pick up someone and take them to a tooling company in this green region. Again, so this is imagine the Jetsons. Uh, around Philadelphia. So for something like this, we can again write down a specification using STL. I won't show you what it looks like because it's pretty, <clears throat> it'll, be to take, it'll take up the entire slide if I write it down. Um, and we do this for a mission planning horizon of 15 minutes. Um, and shown over here is a video that has sped up about 10x of these five UAVs. And also I visualize the trajectories that our method generates. Again, the entire planning is in 3D, but I'll just show you a top-down view. So if we focus on the red and blue um, drones, they have picked up stuff from the DHL part of the airport. They went to the business complex. You see them waiting inside the green box. That is because I'm using the eventually always um, nesting of operators. And then they would repeat the process because I'm also using the eventually always, uh, oh, sorry, the always eventually nesting of operators. You see a similar behavior for this autonomous air shuttle in black. It goes to this parking lot. It's waiting there to let passengers on and off. Um, once it waits for a predefined amount of time, um, it's going to go back to the air, <clears throat> to the international terminal, repeat the process, and so on. So anyway, so that's um, you get the idea. For something like this, that is even 15 minutes of length, we can generate trajectories in less than a minute, and then the robots can fly it out. So in all these, in the method that we saw right now, the decision making for all of these agents is being done by a central source. What we want to do next is solve the same problem, that is generate trajectories to satisfy STL specifications, but now let each agent make their own decision and cooperatively by communicating with each other, come up with a solution. So <clears throat> then we introduce this method called fly by distributed logic. The idea over here is, and again, I'll go over this very quickly, divide my fleet of robots into in, of interest into different groups. These groups could be by type of mission that they're doing, could be in like, for example, air shuttles are one group, um, taxis are another group, or they could be by the op by whoever's operating them. Like Amazon could have their own group, um, Indigo could have their own group, and so on. Each drone inside a group is going to solve a smaller optimization. Um, as a convex subproblem. Again, details we'll skip, but they're solving problems over just their decision variables while taking into account the decisions made by the others at a previous iteration. All these robots we're going to assume can communicate their solution with each other, and they're going to solve this until convergence. So there are some convergence guarantees. I'll skip those. Associated with those guarantees are that if we converge to a nice enough point with a high enough robustness value, 
you've satisfied the specification and you generate trajectories that can be flown out. So again, um, I'll skip the details of the method, but go back going back to our benchmark problem of reach avoid, where we want to, again, we want the robots to reach the goal set within an amount of time while avoiding the unsafe set and so on. Our distributed method can also solve it. So shown over here are some simulated trajectories where these four robots making their own decision and communicating with each other, make it inside the goal set within eight seconds and they don't crash into each other or go inside the unsafe set. So quickly, if we look at some results of how does our centralized approach and our decentralized approach um, compare to each other, as we increase the number of UAVs, we note that the distributed method, FVDL, is actually faster than the centralized method. So it turns out it's almost three times as fast when it comes to finding trajectories to satisfy the specification. If we let it run to completion and find the most robust trajectories, it's still about three times faster than the centralized method which is great, uh, but of course, there's no free lunch. And what you end up <clears throat> paying with over here is that the distributed method finds trajectories that are not as robust as the centralized method, which kind of makes sense. The distributed optimization only has convergence guarantees to an extreme point, whereas the centralized one has convergence guarantees to local minima in the robustness landscape. But anyway, the takeaway is that the distributed method does work and it does find um, trajectories that and satisfy the spec. We'll also take a look at one more example where it's a reach avoid problem, but now with precedence, where I use what's called the until operator in STL. And what this says over here is that, again, I want two UAVs. I want them to both enter the goal set within six seconds while avoiding the unsafe set, not crashing into each other. But I don't want my robot two to get inside the goal set before robot one does. And what this says over here is not P2 in goal until in a time interval of six seconds, P1 gets inside goal. So again, the until operator is in fact the operator from which we derive the always and the eventually operator as well. So for something like this, again, we can solve it using flyby distributed logic. Can't quite tell in this view. It looks like both of them make it inside the goal set at the same time. But if you look at the top down view, you'll see that robot two, which is in pink, is going to slow down and let the robot in blue get there first and then it goes inside the goal set. We can also do much more complicated specifications, solve them in a distributed manner, but I'm going to skip this video in the interest of time. Um, we're also interested in looking at this now problem uh, when you have partially known dynamics. So right now in the, all the problems that we've studied, we know everything about the environment, we know everything about the robots, there are no disturbances, but what happens if you have, for example, some unmodeled wind disturbance acting on these robots. So we've studied that problem as well. Um, think in the interest of time, since we're at 1045, I'm going to skip this entire thing. The takeaway is that, again, this is the paper under review, so it's fine if I you know, skip most of it. The takeaway is that we propose a method that is data-driven, as in it tries to learn how these disturbances are as a function of the state of the robot. And then we propose a control method that actually gives you safety or gives you some nice guarantees, um, as opposed to methods that do, do not take these disturbances into account. So putting all that together, what we've seen for motion planning with STL specifications, we propose these different methods, centralized, decentralized. We also have other work that we did not talk about over here, but we have an entire tool chain of methods that allow us to generate trajectories and fly them out with strong guarantees, and we can do that for multiple agents satisfying these complex STL requirements. Um, so in each of these methods, one thing we relied upon was that we do have a physics model of what's going on. We, for example, we generate these joke minimizing splines for these robots. We have the dynamics of the robots. Now what we want to do is look at a different abstraction of our missions. So rather than working in a continuous space, we work in a more discrete grid-like or graph-based environment. And we'll try to learn um, policies to satisfy these complex requirements in a model-free manner. So for that, this is Again, ongoing work, uh, collaboration with Sebastian Fischmeister, uh, led by our student Sorush. Um, and this is where we're using reinforcement learning to generate policies that satisfy class of specifications called linear temporal logic specifications. So you can think of linear temporal logic as, again, as opposed to STL, where we had these specifications over continuous or real valued trajectories. Now think of linear temporal logic, just like STL, but without any of the continuous part. 
That is, there are no time intervals. Um, there are no real valued uh, variables like positions or velocities that we're looking at, but we're looking at labeled states. For example, as shown in this grid world, there are states that have labels A, B, C, and D. An example of a LTL or linear temporal logic specification uh, for a sequential task, a navigation task over here, is as shown. So the specification in plain text says always not D and not B until A and not C until B and eventually always C. So sounds complicated, but all this is saying is I want the robot to first visit A, then visit B, and then go to C and stay there without ever visiting a state labeled D. So this STL, uh, this LTL formula is shown uh, in the bottom right of the page is a succinct way uh, of writing down what this particular uh, requirement is. We focus on environments that are what we call Markov decision processes or a grid world where you take a decision and you end up in a next state based on some probability of transitioning to a next state. And in this problem, we don't know what these probability of transitions are. So that's the uh, model free component to it. So this sounds like a reinforcement learning problem where I have to learn a policy to navigate this grid world and maximize the motion of a reward. But the problem with trying to do this for linear temporal logic is that there is no naturally defined reward signal for each time step. So if you're familiar with reinforcement learning, you usually have a setup where you're trying to maximize the cumulative sum of rewards over time. In this case, you get a reward only at the end of the trajectory. But then the reward could be thought of as one or true if your trajectory satisfies the specification, otherwise it's false. So just like the uh, notion of an STL specification, which is a, an LTL specification, is also a binary valued output from it. Um, another problem is that the LTL satisfaction problem is not Markovian. That is, it's not memoryless. For example, if my robot was in a state over here, as my laser pointer is trying to show, whether it goes up or whether it goes down or whether it goes to the left depends on which tasks it's done before. Has it visited A? Has it visited B? Is it now going towards C? So it means that I need some notion of memory in my policy, which again is not standard in reinforcement learning. So the first thing we do is try to map this into a standard reinforcement learning problem. And let's do it through the simple example of a robot in a three grid world. D is a danger set that it doesn't want to go to, so it's always not D. And A is a goal set that it wants to get to, so and eventually always A. The environment can be represented by a graphical uh, Markov decision process where you take an action and you end up in a state by some given probability. The LTL specification can also be translated to a graphical system. Um, won't get into it, but there's automatic ways of going from an LTL spec to, well, to a particular automata. In this case, it's a limit deterministic Buki automata. And the nice thing about it is that it has this accepting state, which tells me if I hit labels A and D, if I hit them in a sequence such that I get to Q1, I can stay in Q1 as long as I don't visit D. So now it's again a system that does not have the does not require memory and everything is now Markovian. In fact, we can take the product of the MDP and the limit deterministic Buki automaton to get a product automaton. Again, it's this giant graphical system. The nice part about it is that Again, you don't need memory, and you naturally have a reward for visiting states that correspond to visiting accepting states in the LDBA. So this now looks like a very standard reinforcement learning problem where you have actions that will get you from one state to the next. There's a probability of getting to a next state depending on what action you took. And you have rewards for visiting certain states, penalties for visiting others. And you can just then define a reward function that encourages visiting accepting states. So on the right is a GIF of a robot doing the sequential navigation task. What we end up learning is a policy uh, where the architecture is that we have a neural network combined with a Monte Carlo tree search. Details you don't have to get into, but the uh, it's trained uh, via this approach called self-play, which is very similar to AlphaGo or AlphaGo Zero, which was this class of algorithms um, developed to play the game of Go, and they ended up beating the human champion in Go as well. So we use notions derived from AlphaGo to actually learn policies that can solve LTL specifications. Um, as one um, benchmark, we have this office world where you have a robot whose job is to bring mail and coffee to an office. So mail is in these locations marked by M, coffee is in these locations marked by C, 
should bring it to the office O while avoiding decorations shown in D. And these gray circles are regions that the robot just can't get into. These are walls. It can be represented by an LTL specification as shown over here. So Psi 4 is what our requirement is. And it turns out our method, which is called SP4 LTL, compared to a state of the art method called QRM that uses handcrafted reward machines. So our method is fully automated. It generates these product systems and then learns policies on top of it. QRM relies on some handcrafting of a reward function. And as we give the robot more time, so as capital T goes from 50 to 75 to 200 time steps, you see that our um, method gets better at successfully completing the task. So these numbers shown over here are the probability of successes plus minus the standard deviation of this probability. So at t equal to 50, QRM does better. Our method isn't doing all that well. But as time increases, our method gets to 100% success rate, whereas QRM kind of stagnates. Um, it's another example of the sequential delivery problem. Turns out it was very challenging for the state-of-the-art method. It could not solve it. Our method, on the other hand, can solve it when the environment is both deterministic, that is, you end up exactly where you want to go, or stochastic, where you try to take a, you take an action, but you end up where you want to go only with the probability of 0.8. And the method still does very well. Um, so yeah, quickly, our method um, outperforms state-of-the-art baselines in three out of the four benchmarks. In one benchmark, it does only as well as the state-of-the-art method. Our ongoing work is to extend this to environments that are adversarial. For example, in Pac-Man, you have the uh, ghost that's trying to get to Pac-Man. Um, so we're trying to extend our method where we have environments and other agents that are possibly adversarial. And of course, the end goal of all this is not to stay to these abstracted away environments, but to get to autonomous robot decision making. So this grid world can be thought of as an abstraction of the lanes and the road architecture that you have, and the decisions are high level behaviors like staying in the lane, going straight, accelerating, so on. And with that, I'm pretty much done with the technical part of it, and I'll get to some open challenges that may relate to hopefully cybersecurity and privacy. Um, but yeah, before we go on, I should also talk about the limitations. These methods are not a silver bullet for solving these problems. In fact, they suffer from this limitation that they are incomplete algorithms. That is, there's no guarantee that you'll find satisfying trajectories using either flyby logic or SP4 LTL. All of these methods that we developed are unfortunately not complete. That is, even if there may exist a satisfying trajectory, there's no guarantee that our method will solve it. Empirically, of course, it's a different story. It looks like it does solve it every time, but we don't have any strong mathematical guarantees on that. The multi-agent methods, like distributed flyby logic, they assume lossless and instantaneous communication. Um, if you work with realistic systems, you know that this is a very far-fetched assumption, and we haven't really explored how robust our method is to violations of this assumption. And one of the, um, I guess, the security or the robustness part of this is that our methods, the correctness of the mathematical guarantees that we have, depend on the environment and the uncontrolled agents either being known perfectly or being non-adversarial, which is not always the case. Um, this leads us to one open challenge where I think both cybersecurity and privacy play a role, and that is in, again, air traffic scheduling or motion planning in urban air mobility where you have unmanned aerial vehicle fleets operated by different operators. So in the methods over here, we have assumed that these operators are sharing all information with each other. That is, Amazon is telling everyone else just exactly where does it want to go drop a package, at what times it's planning to do that, and so on. That's most more likely than not not going to happen in the real world. So then can we still have methods that work? And also, if I do have this type of information about the other operators, can one operator actually um, generate its own requirements in a way that impede operations of the other operator? So if I have someone who's acting adversarially, um, can I design a protocols that are robust to that or that are secure enough? And one of the main challenges in this type of large scale motion planning is that of fairness. That is, am I being fair to all the groups? Am I giving them um, trajectories or parts of the airspace such that they don't have to pay extra for the airspace or they're not burning extra fuel as opposed to the other groups? So that is, um, in fact, we have ongoing collaboration with Osama Abbas and his student at Oregon State University. We were talking about fairness, 
But this problem of what is secure in these protocols is, of course, one that is entirely open. Um, so with that, I conclude my talk. Hopefully there was something of interest in there. And again, it was not a cybersecurity or privacy talk, but there are problems in here, uh, as you saw, that definitely relate to those two uh, concepts. Right, and code for everything that we do can be found out, can be found at either my GitHub or my lab's GitHub. So all these are open source implementations. So yeah, thank you everyone for your time. Thank you, Yash. Uh, I invite anyone who has any questions to either put it in the Q&A or the chat. Um, but to get us started, I do ha have a couple, Yash. One security related, one not so much. Um, with respect to robustness, uh, you described a few ways in which you look at how, in this, in your examples, how, how drones keep a certain distance from each mm -hmm. other or, or deal with maybe wind gusts and stuff. Is yeah. there, is that all learned behavior or has that been programmed in? Because where I'm thinking is like wear and tear as the, as a drone or a robot continues to be operated, um, its specifications or what it's capable of would, I imagine, diminish over time. Absolutely, yeah, the, uh, that's a great point. So right now, it's not a learned behavior. It is one that's pre-programmed in because we are trying to maximize this notion of robustness. So our aim is to generate these trajectories. Think of them as with the largest safety tubes around them. Um, as there is wear and tear, you expect that the robots probably won't follow their trajectories as well. So they'll get closer and closer to the edges of the safety tube. Um, what we can do in that case, I'm not entirely sure. Uh, but yeah, we're trying to be inherently as robust as possible. Understood. I should also point out that when we talk about robustness, we're actually looking at a very uh, restrictive notion of robustness. For example, I say that all trajectories inside this tube are going to be robust, but you can also fly outside of this tube and then get back inside this tube and still be robust. So you could redefine notions of robustness that maybe give you some more leeway, but just Mathematically, this was the most sound notion that we had. And, and then my, my second question um, with regards to service and privacy is on your your last example of what you're doing in collaboration with those in, um, you said Washington State? Uh, Oregon State. Oregon State, um, where it's kind of an open model for, for air traffic control. It, yeah. it would... Um, so my question stems from more of a privacy point of view, but it also seems to me like it could move into adversarial. So if someone knows um, the pathways or give them pattern of pathways of, for example, AWS sending packages or yeah. any other given example, mm -hmm. one could think about maybe impeding their competitor or, yeah. or, or being an adversary on purpose knowing yeah. uh, that so how is has there been thought of as beyond fairness of maybe uh, looking at privacy and then just you know anonymizing i, I don't know uh, i'm curious yeah, uh, what your thoughts are on that. that's a great question and i think that's a larger discussion to be had with experts in security and privacy uh for us we're looking at notions of fairness that um try to make sure that again the architecture that we're proposing is a combination of a centralized and decentralized approach where essentially the centralized air traffic controller think of it gives you regions in which you can fly um, the information that is shared between um, each of the operators is mostly just going to be here are the regions that you can get into they're not so much seeing what is amazon trying to do or what is um, you know your city's drone trying to do and so on so hopefully that gives us some built-in security to these type of adversarial cases where you know, like, like, like you said, a competitor tries to fly parts that impede other robots. So we are putting the burden on our centralized uh, air traffic controller for that. Um, but yeah, it's not, again, it's not the uh, most secure solution. The aim over there is to have fairness in a sense that if you look at the standard deviation of all um, distances of all flights of similar types, we want to minimize that standard deviation minimize that variance and that's what we're calling fairness right now um that's for all package delivery flights that originate from one zip code going to the other hopefully they fly similar or uh, they fly parts of similar lengths so kind of that's what we're calling fairness it's not necessarily tied to uh secureness of these parts just yet but yeah, it's a great question and i think that's a much larger discussion to be had interesting um 
I'll invite the audience to ask any other questions. I'll give it a. So we have one from Peter. Would environmental conditions be drone centric or aggregated? For example, the draft caused by one drone on another. No, oh, that's a great question. Um, right now we're thinking of them as being drone specific. Like, but in this work that I skipped, we're looking at, at as each agent is trying to learn the disturbances as how they impact their own dynamics. Like how is this wind impacting the robot based on the orientation of the robot? Like if I'm trying to fly sideways to a vent, that will impact the robot differently than if I'm flying head on into that vent. Um, so right now we're looking at disturbances in that sense. Inter-robot disturbances where the downdraft of one robot washes out the other, um, that's a hard thing to model and we're not quite getting into that. One practical way of avoiding it is so we're talking about this minimum distances between robots. Rather than thinking of them as being um, distances in the two norm or the circular sense, think of them as being disturbances in an ellipsoidal sense, where you know I can fly closer to a robot on the side, but if I'm below or above it, I need to be further away. So that would maybe somehow, yeah. So that should um, sidetrack the problem a little bit, uh, where you don't have to worry about how one robot is disturb disturbing the other. Um, but yeah, we're not explicitly dealing with that yet. Yeah, that's an interesting question, though. Um, I'll ask one more to give someone else a chance to ask, but if after that, then there's none, then we'll, we'll stop. So my question mostly is around policy. When you give the example of having drones, I guess maybe be simulated around the airport in, in Philadelphia and Pennsylvania. Yeah. Obviously, they weren't carrying people and stuff, but what what uh what did, were you actually flying drones doing these pathways or was oh, this no, no. mostly okay Th this is all simulation we okay would not we would never get permission to do this in reality and so that's where <laughs> my question comes to the, what what is the um the regulatory environment like to to eventually get permission like that would that be something you'd be under, able to, to to comment on yeah absolutely so the reason why we came up with this example was was actually after discussion with folks at the FAA and NASA. So for example, my collaborator, Hossam Abbas at Oregon State, he works closely with folks at FAA. Um, so they are, uh, again, with NASA's Urban Air Mobility Grant Challenge, they are proposing a set of regulations that will relax what certain types of, again, unmanned aerial vehicles can do, including operations around airports. Right now, the regulation is, um, forget what it's called, it's FAA, I think it's part 107, which essentially is for all unmanned aerial robots, the robots need to be within line of sight of the operator. So missions like this can't be carried out right now anyway. But you know, again, NASA and FAA are aware that things beyond this are going to happen. And just like, um, so right now they're offering like waivers on a case by case basis, like for Amazon, for example, they probably do have a waiver to do operations way beyond line of sight. Um, of their um, operators, for example. Um, so in that type of a world, of course, they do see operations happening in dense urban areas where they're mostly looking at things like limits on velocity, altitude limits. They have some rules like you can't be, if you're flying over a building, you need to be at least 100 feet above uh, the top of the building. You can't be like, I think, a 300 meter circle of a building if you're flying below the ceiling of that. So they do have a set of rules. Um, I don't think any of them are laws yet. They are mostly in a proposal stage, and FA and NASA keep having this back and forth on it. Thank you. We have another question. Uh, are aerial highways with specific lanes and directions uh, being considered to manage aerial traffic? Absolutely, yeah. And the answer is yes, it is being considered. NASA calls them 4D uh, trajectories where the um, Essentially, it's space, time, and your restrictions on what you're going to do. For this work that I was talking about um, for air traffic control, um, we are actually operating in this paradigm where there are these type of lanes in the sky type of a scenario. And it's really the lane allocation that we're looking at, not so much planning trajectories for individual robots, but telling operators that you can be in this particular lane at this particular point in time. So yeah, it's a great question. It has it is being studied. I think it's been studied for about a decade or so. And that is one of the proposals that 
in FAA has for how the airspace will be used. They also are proposing a tiered usage system where certain lanes are more expensive versus the others. So there's also a monetary component to it. Yeah, uh, thank you for your presentation. Uh, you. I was just uh, curious, like, what would be the worst case when you are planning the trajectories? Uh, I noticed that you use like waypoints. Mm -hmm. So what is the effect of like uh, choosing different waypoints? And do we have any guarantee that like uh, there is no collision in between those waypoints? Yeah, great that, question. Yeah, really... yeah uh, so we do have guarantees that nothing bad happens between the waypoints. Part of it is that we, we consider not just these waypoints as shown in blue, but also um, these high frequency samples in red that connect the waypoints uh, in a unique way. That unique way is what we call jerk minimizing splines. So think of them as just trajectories that connect P1 to P2 and so on. Um, and even though, even though these are in discrete time, we still have guarantees. For example, if this last uh, requirement over here is satisfied, then this means that in continuous time, nothing bad is going to happen between these two red samples either. So we do have Strong so is that like uh, that. for for the red dots? Uh, do mm -hmm. you only consider like some safety specifications, or like uh, also other like the like the same as the blue ones? You also consider like the general yeah. like um, LTL specification. It's the full STL specifications. The STL specification is evaluated over the trajectory that's given by, for example, this red, red, blue, red, 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 blue kind of sequence. Uh, then. Then how, like, why it makes a difference? Like, what is the difference between blue and red? Because um, I would assume that, like, choosing waypoints should make it uh, kind of the calculation easier somehow. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So if you, like, consider, like, do the same, treat them this in the same way, the blue and red, then uh, what is the difference and how does it help? That's a good question. That's So the subtlety here is that, even though we treat these the same, in our optimization, these red points don't show up. What shows up are linear functions of the blue points. So each of these red points over here, shown in the bottom, is a linear function of these blue points. Mm -hmm. So in my optimization itself, just think of replace all of these red points with functions of the blue points. So when I write down the optimization, my variables remain just the blue points, but implicitly I've taken into account everything that's happening between these blue points are taken into account these red points of the full trajectory as well. So, and again, what allows me to do that is that I essentially have a nice close form representation of these jerk minimizing splines. Um, yeah, uh, that's right. a great question, but that's a detail that kind of is subtle. You'll have to find it in the paper, mm -hmm. I guess. Yeah, thanks. Yeah, thank you, Malav. Great questions. All right, um, that is everything. Everyone else, have a good day. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Thank you, Colin, Eric. See you. See you guys.